Hi, for this video, I want to show you how to do a t-test using the rejection region decision rule. So I'm telling you that this is a t-test, but in the real world, when you're solving these problems or working with this, you have to be able to figure out which of the tests you're going to use. So let's start with that first. Um, and those are called the assumptions and the conditions, and that's what allows you to use a certain test. Okay, so let's read through the problem so we can kind of look for keywords that kind of help us decide that we are going to be using the t-test. And so what we have is a fitness magazine claims that the mean cost of a Zumba class is less than $12. So anytime you see the word mean, that needs to trigger, and you're only talking about one mean, that you're going to use either the z-test or the t-test. Okay, um, the difference between the two is we use a z-test when we know the population standard deviation, and we use the t-test when we don't know the population standard deviation. Majority of the time, you're going to use a t-test because you're not going to know the population standard deviation. So let's look to see what we have. Okay, um, so a random sample of 40 Zumba classes has a mean cost of $11.25 and a standard deviation of $2.50. So this standard deviation right here is describing the sample. So since you're describing the sample, that's going to point to you using the t-test. Okay, um, so we would say sigma is unknown because sigma, remember, is the population standard deviation. We know the sample. Okay, so in this case, we would say that S is $2.50. So this is the sample standard deviation, not the population standard deviation. Um, the other conditions that have to be met, and depending upon the textbook that you're using, there are different assumptions and conditions listed in different textbooks, so make sure that you reference your textbook for the specific ones that your course is looking for. Um, the one thing about stats textbooks is they're not always consistent. Some of them have different assumptions and conditions for different tests. Okay. Um, so the other things that you have to have is you must have a random sample. Um, random sample helps to control bias. So since we have a random sample, we would write that down. And then the other one for the central limit theorem to kick in, we have to have a sample size that is greater than or equal to 30, or it has to come from a normally distributed population. One of these must be true. Okay, so if we look at this, our sample size is 40. So since our sample size is 40, we can continue since n is greater than or equal to 30. Okay, um, it doesn't matter what the population looks like if you have a sample size that is greater than or equal to 30. If it's less than 30, you do have to come from a roughly normally distributed population because if it's not roughly symmetric and you have something that's very skewed using a smaller sample size, um, isn't going to be um, as easy to work with. Okay, so once you've decided which test that we can use, so that since the conditions are met, we can use a t-test, and some textbooks call this the t-test for the mean, but the biggest thing is that you have a t-test. Okay, you could put the t-test for the mean, that would be the same thing. So now the most important part is setting up your null and your alternative hypotheses correctly. The null hypothesis must always contain equality, so it has to be either less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, or equal to. And the alternative always has to have a statement of inequality, so like less than, greater than, not equal to. And so you have to look at what your claim is and be very careful about the claim as it's stated and which claim you're testing. So we're testing the claim that the mean cost for a Zumba is less than $12. So since it's less than, we're going to make sure that we use the correct symbol. So remember that the mean symbol that we use is mu. So we would say mu is less than $12. So if we write this mathematically, we can see that this is a statement of inequality. So when we're putting it into our null and our alternative, since it is a statement of inequality, we would put it in the alternative. OK, 
Okay, so mean is less than $12. And you can write it out in sentence form or symbol form, like there's different requirements for different courses. I'm just going to write it in symbol form. So we have mu, the opposite, the complement of this would be greater than or equal to 12. Some textbooks just write it as mu is equal to 12. Some are very specific about how you write it. So just kind of, again, refer to your te text. I wish it was more consistent, but it's not always that way. All right, so now let's get into the test itself. It's important to write down the information that you know. So in this case, we need to know our X bar, we need to know our S, we need to know our sample size, and we need to know our degrees of freedom, and we also need to know our alpha level or our critical value. So if we look through the problem, X bar is going to be the sample mean. So the sample mean is $11.25, so that would be our X bar. S we already talked about was $2.50. N we already talked about as being 40. And the degrees of freedom, remember, is N minus one, so this would be 39. And our alpha is our significance level. So 5% significance, we would write this as 0 0.05. If you are not allowed to use technology and you have to draw this out, I would use a rejection region decision rule rather than a p-value just because of the fact that it's easier to work with. So I'm gonna draw out my distribution. This is going to be a t-distribution, which looks like a normal curve, okay? It's a bell-shaped curve. And what we're going to do is we're gonna shade alpha. So alpha being 5%, and I forgot to tell you, I know I just started shading left tail. I guess it would help if I told you why I'm shading this. Okay, the reason it's left tail is we always look at the alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis always determines the tail of the test. So since it's less than, that tells us that it's left tail. If it was greater than, it would be right tail. And if it's not equal to, then it would be a two tail test. So this is going to be a left tail test. And what we are going to do is we're gonna use our T table to find our critical value. And so for some textbooks, they use T sub C. Um, some textbooks use T star. Um, it just kind of depends on your text. Some use T naught. Um, but for this one, I'm just gonna use TC, so the critical value for T. And what we are going to do is, since this is a left tail test, it's a one tail test. So we're gonna pull up our T table, which I have right here, okay? And we're going to be looking for the one tail test. So we're gonna go here until we find the one that we're looking for. So we're looking for 5%, so that's what we're going to do. And then we're gonna find our degrees of freedom. So for this one, our degrees of freedom are 39, and it was the second column, so we're gonna use this value right here, the 1.685. So this is, I'm looking at this column, and I'm gonna go down this column until I find the 39, so the 1.685. Since it's a left tail test, we have to remember that it's going to be a negative T value. Um, if it was a right tail test, you use a positive T value, and if it's a two tail, you use both the positive and the negative for your critical regions. Okay, um, so for this one, we found that it is negative 1.897. Sorry, I just wrote down the answer to my other part. Let me look at the right part of my paper. Negative 1.685. So again, remember that we found that from going to the column that had one tail 5%. So we're looking in the second column and going down until we find degrees of freedom 39 and we get 1.685. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna find our T value and see if it's in the rejection region. Basically, this is going to be our rejection region. So that means that if it falls in the rejection region, we reject. If it falls to the right of this cutoff point, then we are going to fail to reject. So the formula that we're going to use to find our standardized test statistic T is X bar minus mu divided by the sample standard deviation over the square root of our sample size. Now make sure that when you're plugging this into your calculator, you're very careful about putting the parentheses exactly as I have them if you're doing it all at once. 
I see a lot of mistakes with students putting this into your into their calculator incorrectly. Um, so when you're plugging this in, if you just put parentheses around everything, so 11.25 minus 12 in parentheses, and the mu is always whatever is in the null hypothesis. So the 12 is going to be our mu value that we're going to use. Okay, divided by our sample standard deviation. And again, you want to make sure that you put parentheses around this entire denominator, because if you don't, you will end up with the wrong answer. So if I forget this parenthesis here, it will divide by the 2.5 and then divide that answer by the square root of 40. And we want to force the $2.50 or the $2.50 to be divided by the square root of 40 first. So we have to put it in parentheses. Otherwise, our calculator works from left to right. So now here is that other value that I started to write down incorrectly. The negative 1.897 is our value. So now what we're going to do is we're going to compare this value right here to our rejection region. We're going to look to see, does this fall in the rejection region or not? So if we find negative 1.897, we just think about this as a number line. So it's going to start at 0. Anything that's going this way is going to be positive. Over here, the values to the right of this are going to be larger than negative 1.685. And so we can see that negative 1.897 falls to the left of that point, which means that it falls in the rejection region. So since negative 1.897 is in the rejection region, we reject our null hypothesis. Okay. Um, remember that your two decisions that you can make are you're either going to reject the null or you're going to fail to reject the null. You're never going to put the alternative down here. Um, no matter if your claim is about which one your claim is about. So remember, our claim was about this one. Okay, so even though our claim is about the alternative, our decision is always about the null hypothesis. So we will either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we rejected the null hypothesis, which is essentially saying that the evidence points towards this being true. So when we write this out, we always include the level of significance. So at this, in this case, it would be at 5%. We have enough evidence to support the claim. And the text that I use uses the word support anytime the claim is about the alternative and the word reject if it's about the null. So in this case, we have enough evidence to support the claim that the mean cost of a Zumba class is less than $12. So you always want to put the context in here. Um, you want to make it so that anybody understands it. So our evidence points towards the claim being true. Um, we could have had a bad sample, so we can't say definitively that is the case, but that's what our evidence points towards. So in this case, we rejected the null hypothesis, and when we reject the null hypothesis, that points towards the opposite being true. So in this case, the evidence points to supporting the alternative that the mean is less than $12. As always, thanks for watching. I know I kind of went into a little more detail, but it really helps to understand um, why you are doing everything rather than just plugging in the numbers. So I hope that you don't mind that I took a little bit longer than I could have. Um, but like I said, as always, thanks for watching. If you have questions, please let me know. If there are additional topics you need me to cover, please let me know that as well.